We're talking Scar Wars today. That's right. So we're keeping with the theme. Right. And we're, we've changed things up a little bit. So we're going to talk about some of the things we see most commonly in our office and with relations to acne and acne scarring and some of the sequelae of that. We've talked a lot about acne at this meeting. Uh, there's a really good talk today. So we'll, uh, we're going to start and let you see what we see. So we decided to keep it entertaining. We're the only things keeping you guys from lunch today. Is that right? So. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about different cases that we've seen, and we'll just comment on them. And if anybody has any questions, these lights are pretty bright, so just speak up and grab the, the throwable mic and, and, and give your two cents, please. So you're just disclosures for this talk. So, I mean, just famous people. I mean, it, you see acne scarring every day, and people learn to adapt in different ways. And some people, it doesn't seem to bother at all but some people can't look you in the eye. And so it, it, may, it has an impact um, physically, psychosocially. And so we, our goal really is stopping the acne, medical therapy is, is key, and then trying to deal with this as best we can. And it really depends on you know, the, the complication you're dealing with. So this was an older paper that looked at some of the sequelae of acne. And you can see here acne, I'll go back one. You can see your acne scarring here. Um, occurs in, uh, you know, uh, you could say almost everybody, and how you, how, you, how you heal from it really depends on the depth of the defect, the, the amount of inflammation that you have, and then these other sequelae that we see very commonly that can be more disturbing, actually, once the acne scarring is resolved, hopefully, would be the post-inflammatory uh, erythema and the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, both of which in skin of color can be a major ongoing issue. Um, then you see some of the other images, uh, self-image and body dysmorphia, and all these things are very real. So as I mentioned, it's very common. Up to 95% of, of patients clinically will have some evidence of scarring. Uh, but the incidence ranges quite a bit, depending on what type of scarring you're talking about and that thing. But it, you can definitely see where it impacts the, your self-esteem, one's self-esteem. So how do we do it? We talked about really timely therapeutic management, shutting things down. I think Julie had talked a couple years ago, Dr. Harper, about the fact that new scars, and quoting a, quoting a study from Dr. Tan, Jerry Tan, who says that scarring can form six to eight weeks, just as early as six to eight weeks after a lesion forms. And that's, that could be accelerated if you've got an inflammatory lesion. So some of these can normalize, but some of these can be atrophic and they can stick around for, you know, for years and years. So this is a patient that I still take care of, a female. Uh, she's very sebaceous skin, typical, a little bit of, a little bit of rosacea and um, a little bit of female hormonal adult onset acne, you can see sort of, and she's got some ice pick scarring. And you can see this scarring is pretty deep into the, you know, it's, it's punched out. It, for me, this is a, this, this type of scarring is actually very difficult to deal with because you've got to do something to intervene to take out, go to the depth of the scar. So I decided to just punch this out and show you um, what you're dealing with here. So it's not something that's superficial. It's something that can go uh, several hundred microns deep and, you know, really, you got to think about that when you're talking about your therapeutic options. So um, this, this gentleman also had the similar ice pick scarring, and so I brought this case up to show you that um, sometimes we have to combine techniques. So this is a so-called cross technique, which utilizes a high-strength trichlorothetic acid, anywhere between 50 to 90, sometimes even 100%, and it's placed pinpoint into the depth of that scar that I just showed you. The way it's placed has changed over years. It, Original publication was with a, a cotton tip uh, point, or excuse me, a, a, like a toothpick type thing. And what we found is that the, the, I found at least, is that the TCA gets beyond the borders of the scar, which you do not want to do because it's very high strength. So we started incorporating a TB syringe. You can see there a 32 gauge uh, TB syringe, same one I'd use for Botox, drawing up a tiny bit and then placing it directly into the scar, and I get a lot less spread. And you can actually surround those with with Aquaphor or Vaseline and then inject and it, and it reduces that spread even more. But even then, some of his scars needed to be excised because they're a little deeper than that. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we're dealing with. Um, I want to bring Sunil in to talk about, I'm sorry. Can, can you go back one go if back you don't mind? One. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if a lot of you guys are using the TCA cross technique and, and just like Dr. Monavalli described it, do you find that you get some post-inflammatory hypopigmentation that might be longer acting? Definitely get erythema that can last for, and that, that's difficult for guys to cover, so you have to talk to them about that. Um, I, I have not seen any hypopigmentation, but at this strength, um, yeah, you, you, that or hyperpigmentation, you have to consider all the above. So this is more of an advanced technique just simply because 
with that strength TCA, you can really cause a bigger scar, and I've seen that happen. So you've got to be careful with that. But um, yeah, downtime is, a, is an issue with this, I agree. And then, let's, let's go to a, we're going to go through a series of cases. So let's say this, this yet lovely young lady presents to your office, and Perfect. she's obviously skin of color. That is a depressed, uh, sort of distensible scar there on the cheek, but otherwise her skin's in very good shape. So she has mostly these three scars. It looks like uh, maybe a rolling scar, possible box car scar, um, and then I don't know what the third is, probably a rolling scar as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So in terms of the way that I approach it is what's, what's bothering her the most? And that's the first question that I ask. And people are like, well, the scar. I understand that. Is it there's redness? Is it that there's a depression? Is it that when you put makeup on that you see more of this, this uh, shadowing that's there? Um, is it in certain photos? Is it in when you're driving in the car that you're seeing this? And the reason I ask all these questions is because I need to make sure that if she's in that same position where she has backlight or even side lighting that's coming in, can we make sure there's enough of a change that's there? And then uh, once we figure that out and say, let's say uh, it's mostly the rolling scars that are there and she doesn't like it when um, she's taking head-on photos, okay, I think that we may have some great options. For me, I would consider using something simple. You can do a subcision, even just using um, uh, sodium chloride which I guess now is also on back order. So maybe not sodium chloride, but you right. can take it from like a, a saline bag, like a one liter saline bag, put that in, and you can subsize with it. And subcision is quite easy. Uh, you can use either a large bore needle, you can use a smaller needle. And if you have small bits of filler, let's say you're taking a one cc, define, refine, voluma, whatever you want, you can backfill one of those BD syringes using 0.1 cc aliquots. And oftentimes I'll put that in because after I subsize where I'm breaking up the scar tissue inside, I'm laying down 0 0.01, 0 0.02 of that HA product. I was doing that a lot with Bellafil, and I've kind of moved away from Bellafil because at least this, if we have a long-term sequela, I can bring in the hyaluronidase and, and get rid of it. So I think there's a lot of very, very economical ways that we can do it. Okay, and then the key thing for me to recognize when I, is that this is a relatively solitary area. It's, you don't have to involve the whole cosmetic unit which is very helpful, and you don't have to necessarily use the energy-based device, mm -hmm. which is, which is in skin of color, actually, is, is, can, can be a little unpredictable. So let's see what, so what we did here. So in this case, we actually used microneedling. Excellent. Fantastic and so, result. And the nice thing about microneedling, it's not in the, the traditional sense is not energy-based, and it, it covers a lot of ground fairly quickly, and you can adjust the depth. So, and, and, uh, but that, with that type of lesion morphology that Dr. Chilakari explained, um, you would think it would be a mid-dermal, you know, uh, you would be definitely going to be a, a sort of a three, four, six hundred microns. So you want to go a little deeper, and you can see with these devices, you can go up to 2.5 millimeters and get collagen stimulation deeper. And so this wasn't perfect, but it was. She was very happy with it. And my next step would have would have been to offer her a, a filler. And this way, she doesn't have to worry about it. One comment that I have, her whole skin looks brighter. And when I'm looking at the background on both, it looks like it's the same exposure. So her entire skin looks a little bit brighter. And that's one of the studies that we're doing with the, one of the microneedling devices right now. Does just simple microneedling, does that change the light reflection? Can we actually improve hyperpigmentation? We're seeing that in combination, either with just the microneedling, if you do it aggressive enough, and you leave the, uh, the bloody fluid on there and just massage it, and it works great as well. Yeah, the, there's a lot of different microneedling. I mean, this is not new technology. This has really been on the horizon for the last five, seven years. And in this patient, it would be very similar. We're not gonna, we're just gonna, nowadays you can put a little something on top to glide at a serum and just go and do several different depths. And this guy actually did very well himself. But, um, and you can see that uh, I mean, it's it, it relatively cheap and expensive and the results can be, uh, be you can get very good results, very attainable results. Excellent. That's another angle. Um, I've got a question. Do you use um, at-home therapy in between? So uh, what's, the, what's the time interval between your treatment sessions? We're probably at about every two to three weeks, I okay. would say. And we have them maintain. You know, the, the issue with this is that whatever they're using is going to penetrate a little bit more, I think, for the next 24 hours right. to 48 hours. So if you've got something like a retinoid, you may induce a retinoid dermatitis. You may induce, so you want to tell them to stay away from some of those things. Um, you, may, you might switch them to something else just to get them through the first couple of days and then go back. But I think maintaining their topical therapy is key. They can apply it everywhere else. You can see he's got lesions mm -hmm. in the glabella and other areas. If he's on an oral antibiotic, I tell them to stay on that. Okay. 
And we've used at-home rollers as well that you can order on Amazon. They range from $8.49 to about $12.50. They're usually they're going from 0.25 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters. There's some that sell at 0.75, which is less tolerable, at least in my humble opinion. Right. And I'm a guy, so I'm a chicken. Um, so I can do a 0 .5, 0 0.25 pretty easily. And I have them do that once a week in between sessions. And I space mine a little bit further apart, uh, four to six weeks apart. Good tip. Uh, Perfect. Let me just drive for just a yeah. second, if you don't mind. So again, case study, and I'm hoping that you guys will help me with this. This is a 42-year-old woman who came in, and I think I have a side profile. Okay, good. I, I don't have a side profile on her, but if let me see if I can point at the screen here. So her biggest thing is she has these deeper scars that are on either cheek here. She says that she sees them when she is putting on makeup. She notices it mostly when she's driving. So if she, she's taking her son to school, she noticed that there's um, this reminder of her acne when she was a child. So any suggestions that you have right off the bat? Yeah, I think some of that she's thinner anyway and you get some volume de depletion and that's kind of making it, not, she's not so much, but it's in an area where it would be noticeable and it's an area where if she didn't have that scarring, you would consider doing a little bit of filler or injectable, yeah. I think. Um, but uh, you know, great features in her and I can see where this would be troubling. Um, I don't have a side view, but I what do, I would do, you do have a side view, okay. I, I don't, I apologize, oh, don't. I do not. That's okay, well, what, I, what I would do is, I would be interested in, how, again, how much of the cosmetic subunit there is involved, and um, would we need to incorporate an energy-based device, or could we just target with, with injectables or, or microneedling? Perfect, and so this is what we offered. Um, for the audience, if you guys don't mind, uh, taking 10 seconds to answer. These are these are the treatment options that I was thinking in my head. Can we use something like a PMMA, a Bellafil type product, HA filler, PLLA, which is Sculptra, an energy-based device, or maybe even a combination of all of them? Let's see what people think. Good, perfect, because that's what I was thinking myself, is uh, why don't we do a combination? Let me give you an idea of what uh, we were able to do. So oftentimes we don't talk about how do we do subcision, and this is just using a 25 gauge. You can use a cannula, you can use a needle. In my case, I'm using a needle here. I'm using PLLA, so it's just Sculptra, and then I'm putting it in place while I'm subsizing. So I describe it like laying down seeds um, that are gonna be fertilized by the water that's inside the skin. So as we're laying down the seeds, you can see that I'm going with a multi-angle approach, and then I'm gonna switch from that three o'clock position to a um, six o'clock position, so about perpendicular for where I was, to then go ahead and subsize more. Pretty quick procedure. Because you're putting something that has numbing medicine already built into it, we can go immediately afterwards to an RF microneedling device. We now have, um, nine different RF microneedling devices because the generations keep getting better. And I think what we can offer today is even better than this. Uh, this was considered a second generation. This was the Infini. Um, and so with that, we can reproducibly get results like this. So this lovely lady, she comes in from Austin to get her treatments. Um, she now comes once every, I think four or five months just to maintain the cosmesis, but uh, she was pleased with the result. And it was one of those where she's like, well, I still have a little bit right here. I said, okay, well, let me put the pictures together and see where we're at. One of the comments that I wanna share with the audience is, we're helping with the physical appearance and the improvement, but we're never actually truly addressing the mental component that's there. And so when we do the initial consult, when I do the initial consult with the patient, I always describe that. I say, oh, we're aiming for about a 70 or 80% improvement. And in my head, I'm like, what the hell is 70 or 80%? I don't know myself. And the way that I can um, translate it to the patient is we're looking for something where you can go to the gym without putting makeup on and you feel still pretty darn confident. There's gonna be certain times where you see it with side lighting or backlighting and you're still gonna be able to see that there's slight depressions. And I always tell every single patient that comes in, we are not addressing what happened to you. And I don't know how to address something that's happened to you, meaning, when, you, when she sees her face, she still remembers that huge blemish that she had, or maybe uh, it happened on a, an important time where she was going out on a date or something like that. So I can't address that component of it. So even though to, to the, the average consumer who's out there, meaning you go to somebody at a party and look at them, you're like, oh, you look amazing. In their head, they're still seeing little acne scars. The next one, let's see here. Oh, just a okay. close up. Yeah, and those are, amazing results and they're gonna 
Uh, now this is, this is a little tougher, and it's tougher for a couple reasons. One is she's very dark skin type 5, 6. It's not projecting very well. Um, but we'll, we'll talk you through what we see. And some of this is she has had a history of inflammatory and comedonal acne. She's gotten some post-inflammatory changes. She has some prominent pores. Um, very concerned about her overall complexion. I know it's kind of hard to see on the image, but you may have, you know, every, being in the audience may have seen something like this. It's very difficult to treat. And when the acne goes away, these post-inflammatory lesions can last, persist for, for a long time. So what do you do in this situation? Um, I think there's a couple things. Uh, you, you get the acne under control, and we were able to do that orally and topically, so we didn't need to worry about that. But then how do you deal with the sequelae? Well, old, you know, there's a couple ways. The chemo Does anybody do chemical peeling in the audience, which is a very viable treatment option for her? I would probably start with the salicylic acid, you know, because they're called beta peel, 20% or you know, 15%, 20%. That's one option. Um, there's a couple other new peels that have come out um, that you could you know, I mean, you'd talk about. And the benefit of that would be a full face rejuvenation. In this case, we chose to go with the device route. And we use a technique that's become very popular um, after its inception in Asia and is still used in Asia countless times a day. And that is taking a Q switch or a picosecond laser. And I, you, know, you might think that you have to have a higher, higher expensive picosecond, but you really don't. Q switch. The ag lasers are around and they, they're very reasonably priced and they're very hardy. And so you take this laser, but it's how you do it in the very low energy mode, the very high rep rate. So it's firing eight to 10 hertz in a very large spot size. And you do that a couple passes over and your endpoint is just a mild erythema. And so you just use a circular motion or whatever your technique is, just make sure you're covering all the areas and you're not getting too much redness. And you do that a couple times, you could do it uh, every other week, um, and I would tell the patients, you know, five, six, seven treatments, and that alone can eliminate the pigment with virtually no downtime. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And when you're doing this, uh, we call it laser toning, it's like you're painting. So you're, you're just uh, painting across that entire forehead, across the cheek. And just like uh, Gilly was talking about, I do sub subunits. So we're going to do the forehead first, then we go over to the cheek. And I ask our aestheticians, or if, we're, if I'm doing it myself, I feel with the back of my hand to make sure that we're not getting too much uh, heat that's being generated. So this is not a, a photothermal event. This is a photomechanical event. You're trying to break up some of the pigment. And uh, just like Dr. Manavali was talking about in terms of chemical peels, remember, you can order chemical peels for pennies on the dollar. So even if you're starting with somebody who's this darker skin type at a TCA 15%, you're getting rid of that top layer of skin. You're not necessarily going to have that much peeling that occurs if they have good epidermal barrier there, uh, but you'll still get some pretty significant changes. And of course, I'm going to combine it with a, a retinoid to make sure that she's on board with that. And then tomorrow, if uh, you guys come back, I'll be talking about some of the other, the other topicals that we can use for hyperpigmentation. Ooh, this is a tough one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see a lot of red. He's, I still see some active acne that's on the mustache line as well as the glabella. Um, it looks mostly like comedonal acne. Mm -hmm. And has he had anything like a hydrofacial or anything to extract those little bumps? So this was several years ago before okay. hydrofacial became popular, but I think that would be a good option now. There's a lot of congestion there, and I think there is. those type of vacuum-assisted devices can help. And is he on a retinoid? He, he was on a retinoid. Okay, so he's already on a retinoid. So what you're seeing Quite is- Quite red. Uh, yeah, so we, and very frustrated, and, and a young kid. And so um, we're, we're device people. So one of the devices, and you can speak to this because you've had a lot of experience with it, um, is, is to try to combine a device that's lower energy, not gonna cause him any, any you know, additional issues with, with melanin in his skin. And so in this case, we used a, a vacuum-assisted pulse light device that you've was this uh, you've seen called the TheraClear. Yeah, TheraClear. And this was just two treatments. So I'll let uh, Dr. Chilakari talk about this device. It's lovely. So it's interesting. It does use a suction similar to your, it's a little bit more powerful than your hydrofacial. So it brings the skin into closer contact where, where the IPL is. It uses, an IPL just means that it's a multiple wavelengths of light. So the cutoff filter on this one, if I remember correctly, was 850 or 825 uh, on the high side and on the low side it was 400 or 425. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to hit both the redness as well as improving the active acne. And we saw that uh, with that particular wavelength of light, and you can use your IPL as well, 
even in this darker skin type, um, you're going to find that it does get absorbed by some of the por portoporphyrin, and that the collateral damage is actually to the sebaceous gland. So the sebaceous gland will actually shrink. Um, if you don't have that device and you have a, an, an NDAG, an NDAG can work quite well. There's a 650 microsecond NDAG that specifically was marketed for, for active acne as well as the erythema. That uh, brand name is called Aerolace. I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. So there's neat things. Just figure out what you have inside your armamentarium. If you don't have any device and you're talking about what else we can do, you can do a modified Jesner's peel, um, and that actually improves the overall skin barrier. You can do one pass at the beginning, that'll improve the barrier. And there's a couple of different companies that are out there that have topical vitamin B, uh, B3, so it's niacinamide. Niacinamide is an anti-inflammatory. If you use niacinamide combined with something called silymarin, S-Y-L-M-A-R-I-N, uh, -S -S something like that, that combination actually calms down the red and makes a pretty significant change. And of course, if you have samples of uh, what is Moveso, mm -hmm. um, Rofade, is there anything else that's on the market? Uh, the those are the two that I've uh, yeah, a lot of experience with Rofade. Um, you can help with, uh, with some of this, some of this as well. Yeah. So. Great case. So it's sort of that, that guy was actually more concerned about the redness than he was the acne itself. So these are some of the options that Sunil talked about. So I would just, in, in summary for this case, I would say try to find something that can help with the erythema, and, and, so, and you don't need a lot of energy with that. So. If we go back one just for one second, yeah. the bottom one, the 1550, 1540, uh, there's also a 1570 and a 1560. So if you have an older device that's the Fraxel, is the brand name Fraxel Dual or Fraxel itself, don't forget that you can use something like that. If you have the Icon base, it's by Palomar or Sinusure, depending on which generation you have. It's a great device, and you don't think about it typically for the erythema, but because it actually improves the skin barrier and it causes neocollagenesis at the base, you're gonna find that the, a lot of the erythema continues to improve by using something like that. I agree, 100%. Just another example of targeting some of that redness and skin of color. So one of the things that uh, you'll hear a lot about, and we hear a lot about at our meetings, are how can we combine some of these therapies to benefit the patient? Because they may have all the above. They may have the acne scarring, erythema, and, uh, and of course, different types of scarring. So um, in this patient, um, is a Latino patient who has, it's hard to see, sort of a, a depressed, distensible, and some bound down scarring on the cheeks. That's exactly what we did. So this video will run, and at the bottom, there's a little bit of there's a little schematic showing the different types of acne scarring we're dealing with in this patient. But as Sunil mentioned, I think marking it out is key before you do your procedure. So you need this really harsh off-center lighting. Uh, in this particular procedure, we use a combination of subcision, a biostimulatory filler. He mentioned PLLA. I like to use Radius mm -hmm. or um, uh, in a three to one or two to one combination. And then so you're, you're getting right underneath the scars. If you look down, some of those scars, you see the tethering bands, especially the boxcar scarring, we want to break those up. And then any one of, a, one of these newer generation radio frequency microneedling devices, because heat is a good thing. Heat stimulates collagen more so than just the microneedling alone. And then you can finish it up with something like, uh, we, this is PRP or topical exosomes, I think work extreme, extremely well, and you don't have to draw the blood on them. And that combination is what you have. We'll finish this off with the LED light here and then show you some of the wow. results that, that we get. So that it's a difficult patient, but she goes through, that was one single session, and she really got some nice results, mm -hmm. and you can see a little closer up uh, that uh, she's gotten some really good collagen stimulation. And what color that, LED so. were you using? We used, um, if we can, of course, mention brand, it was, a, it was the Lutronic Heolite, okay. which I believe is uh, 830. It's, it's a red, so it's, it's, it's a red. red, okay. So it's interesting because, uh, you know, I went to one of Gilly's talks last year and uh, it was you and I can't remember who the other speaker was and they were talking about using LED, it might have been Bob Weiss, Robert Weiss, and they were talking about using LED therapy after treating with the peel, especially for people who are uh, prone to melasma or hyperpigmentation in general. I had never thought about that, so I added that to my practice last year after one of these conferences and we have a little, you can, you can order on Amazon, quite frankly, and they have one that you can stick your face in, they have another one where we can do spot treatments and it's from a company 
company called Clarity RX. So we have two different ones. And so after using anything that generates heat, especially for somebody who's more prone to dyschromia, we do add, add the uh, LED for about uh, seven to 10 minutes afterwards. And that's made a nice change. There's also cool compresses that you can use. And I think you had the cool compresses on mm -hmm. top of the LED uh, that you can use. And those range for around $5 per, per um, mask. And there's a gal that's, she's a German lady and she sells out of Dallas. So she ships a hundred at a time to me. And we found that's made a big difference in terms of cooling down the skin, whether you're doing something as invasive as a resurfacing laser versus even some of these uh, non-insulated arms. Immediately arm. after Yeah, you it's amazing. That, yeah. Uh, and I learned about that from a Cyton conference that I went to. Okay. And she was presenting there. I said, well, does it do anything? And you can actually, we were using a FLIR camera. So you can get a, you can get the fancy FLIR camera, which is about 60,000, or you can get the little $300 version that plugs into the bottom of your mobile phone and we can check the temperature before and after we add that and we can track how long it takes to cool down the temperature it was pretty remarkable it's just another case that may be the same uh, if you see these patients come in think about combination treatments this does involve most of the cosmetic unit mm -hmm. so again in your mind you're thinking how extensive is the scarring because that's going to lead you to have to do a bit more extensive of treatment and then in cross polarization, he's also got the post-inflammatory erythema and you wanna address that. So this is something you might see. So what about some really difficult cases in the six, seven minutes we have left? And I just throw these up for discussion. Oof, that's a tough one. This is a tough one. So this is papular acne scarring, which is common on the chin and the nose. And what would you do in this case? Well, first I'd pray. Then I would try to refer her to, to the Carolinas for Dr. Gilly Manavali, yeah. the expert. <laughs> if neither he, one of those were Let's worked, say he's out of town, <laughs> a meeting in Vegas. I would have her wait, and if she still won't wait, then I would try something. Um, and in this case, I would probably use a combination. I would start with something that's less invasive. So consider using like a 1550 uh, or a 1540 nanometer non-ablative erbium YAG. Right. Uh, apply topical exosomes. Let's make sure that there's good skin health there. Um, once we prep the skin, I'm, I would probably consider using a non-insulated RF microneedling device, um, either scarlet or Silfirm. In this case, um, because she has more erythema there, I would probably use the pulsed wave radio frequency microneedling and see what that would do. But I, this is a tough case. Yeah, I'll tell you what I, I wouldn't do, because I, 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 and I did do. But I, I mean, first of all, you have to recognize what this is, because it's kind of, let's say the acne lesions weren't there, the active acne. You have to recognize this is a subset of acne scarring. Mm -hmm. Uh, this papular acne. And then you have to realize that it's dermal, it's difficult to treat. Uh, I had a couple of these cases where I resurfaced them with erbium and they really didn't get much better. Um, and I was really disappointed and the patient was disappointed. Um, so, and if I'd have recognized sooner what we were dealing with, I might have thought about something else. It's interesting that you mentioned RF microneedling, but there have been some publications out of India where they're using single needle mm -hmm. RF, like you'd find in the, um, in the scarlet, to go and, and heat each one and gotten some, some collapsing, some good work out of Dallas. So just, just a difficult, uh, difficult case and something to think about. That's a good thought. Um, there's something called Agnes, which is a single, right. way, a single needle um, RF device. And so that's a, I never thought about that as an option. I've seen um, refractory calcinosis that looks just like that yeah. in the chin as well as the cheek area. So I wonder if we can go back and try something like that. That's a tough one. So in our last case, about this gentleman. Oh boy. So, and he still doesn't want to come to see you? Well, no, he was interested in going to see you in Houston. <laughs> Great. I thought, yeah, he, yeah. I'm definitely going to be out on a long vacation. This is a tough case because it's very sebaceous skin. He, you can see that they're scarred down, so I'm worried about the tethering, tethering that's there. If he says that he'll give me three days of downtime, I would actually subsize while, and use RF microneedling on the same device, the same day. I would subsize and use something like PLLA or, or uh, Radius. That's a fantastic result. So we did very similar to what you said. I did, uh, but I used some excisions. So I basically did linear excisions to cut Smart. out the, the uh, scarring in the sinus tracts, let that heal, wow. came back and did resurfacing. And it's not a home run, but he was much happier. It's a brilliant result. This gentleman unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but his wife came back and told me that he never left the house. Wow. And in the months and, and year before he died, he was going out, he was going to carnivals, going to fairs. She remembered him riding on one of the Ferris wheels and seeing a smile on his face. Um, first time she'd seen that in 10 years. Wow. And so I always remember this guy and what he taught me. Uh, and, but I, I bring this case up to show you that you know, sometimes uh, com combining and delaying sure. procedures like that and then uh, it can give you the best results. So 
We have about two minutes left for questions. That is, we have one well, we more case. No, 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 that's okay. Let's open to questions because, yeah. um, uh, you know what, let me go forward one yeah. because this just shows you, gives you an idea how do you identify different scar types because it gives you options on what you can use. So this particular um, arrow, you can see it being pointed there. If you guys can use the audience response, how would you classify this scar? And I'll show one after this one, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking for and what, what it allows us to do. Good, and that's exactly what it is. It is a uh, boxcar scar. And how about this one up here? And even if you don't, uh, if you wanna do a quick audience response. Perfect, that's, and it, this, is, this is a rolling scar. So it didn't have as much atrophy, and the reason that I wanted to put those two slides in there and just highlight them very quickly is just to emphasize, you know, the boxcar scar is a lot more difficult to get rid of. Sometimes we're gonna have to do uh, not just subcision, but you have to cut the scar out using a punch biopsy. Rolling scars are much more amenable to using subcision, so it just gives you an idea. I think we have time for just one quick question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say one thing, if you can't tell by visual, use your fingers, because yeah. if you can distend the scar, I think a filler is a really good choice. Yeah. But, yeah. No. All right, was there a yes, question sir. out there? Yes, ma'am. Hello? <laughs> okay. Um, I noticed a, a lot of your uh, lasers that you were going for were more um, non-ablative. Do you, uh, especially with that guy with a very deep fissured Scarring, would you ever? So that go was ablative. More? So that, oh, that was ablative. That was an ablative, fully ablative erbium and a little okay. bit of CO2. So that's a good point. I wouldn't expect the fractional lasers to do much in that setting um, because what you're trying to do, um, same as what you would do with wrinkled skin, is identify the defects and do two things. One, ideally take the borders down, so make the depth between the scar and the surrounding skin less. And then if you can, build up the base. And, some, and that's when maybe a fractional would be an option. So you ablate everything with an erbium and then you might go back with a fractional CO2 and small pattern and treat the base. And you believe it or not, you get some stimulation. So you'll get an evening of the depth of the shoulder of the scar, which is what was really what catches the light and you get those bad shadows. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Do you guys, do you guys package everything together? Do you say, we're gonna, this is the therapy, we're gonna do the yeah. pulse dye, we're gonna do the CO2, and do you do everything right at the same time? Like, yeah, do you so do a I, pulse dye? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I believe I, I heard this at, a, at this meeting from Sunil several years ago that changed my mindset towards a more results mentality. So instead of sort of, I, I, you know, this was our combination therapy. I'll take several different modalities, I'll package them together, and I'll, I'll try to charge for the result. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if I don't get what I'm looking for, I may go back and do it you know, at, at a much reduced cost, but I've found that one more invasive treatment and telling them I'm gonna get you here the best way I can has been um, you know, a, a bit more tolerable for the patient. So. And, and I do, I'm, I'm a big results-based person, so I may, for the initial treatment, it may be, it starts around 2,500, it can go up to 5,000 for that first treatment session. And then uh, when we bring them back in at the four week mark, we're doing a complementary treatment of something usually that's non-ablative that won't take as much of my time, but it'll take our, our medical assistance time. So it encompasses everything that I need. When I get that type of um, like an overall fee, I can do what I need to use. I can use Voluma and Define, Refine. I can use some uh, PLLA, I can use PMMA. So I have a lot more options. And then of course, with whichever devices that I have to, to get you the home run, uh, I'm able to use whatever I need. Yeah, and if you don't need to use all the filler, and we, when you're aliquoting it out like that into smaller syringes, uh, it's still sterile, and you can just use what you need. You don't have to, and that, that saves the patient a little bit of money on that end, but you might have to use it on a different side for a device tip or something. So I think you can, you can really tailor it to their needs. And I, I found that makes the discussion so much easier than breaking down every individual thing. And they don't usually ask. They don't say, well, what am I paying, you know? I've had one person over the last year um, that asked, and she said, well, what if I don't get the sculpture? I said, well, then you need to go somewhere else. Because at the end of the day, it's not to be mean, but it's just I can't achieve the results that I need um, without the tools that I, that I need to use on that particular person. Um, 
So set realistic expectations. And the way that I start charged, or I charge more now, I, yes, of course, there's a consumable cost, but my time is valuable, meaning that it costs me about um, $1,300 per hour just to keep the clinic open. So if I want to do, if that's, if I want to consider that to be 50% of my overhead, then I have to charge a minimum of 2,600 for that hour. So if that procedure takes an hour, it's going to start at 2,600. Thank you. Thank you.